Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I'm Howard Coe and I have the great pleasure of moderating this virtual town hall. I'm the Feinberg professor here at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health and the Harvard Kennedy School. And previously I had the great honor of serving as the U.S. Assistant Secretary for Health and the Massachusetts Commissioner of Public Health. This virtual town hall is entitled State Health Leadership and the Opioid Epidemic. Where are we now and where are we going? And it is presented by the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, ASTHO, in association with the forum here at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. I am very pleased to say we've gathered together an absolutely stellar panel of experts, starting from my immediate right, to address this critical issue. Michael Botticelli, Executive Director of the White House uh, National Drug Control Policy uh, in the past, and now currently uh, head of the Graken Center for Addiction Medicine at Boston Medical Center. To his right, Jay Butler, President of ASTHO and Chief Medical Officer at the Alaska Department of Health and Social Services. And to his right, Monica Burrell, Commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Also joining us remotely is Rachel Levine, Acting Secretary of Health and Physician General at the Pennsylvania Department of Health. And also Terry Klein, <coughs> Oklahoma Commissioner of Health and Secretary of Health and Human Services. Uh, we're gathered here today to address a tremendously complex and pressing public health crisis, the opioid crisis. And as we all know, this epidemic has drawn together multiple sectors in an unprecedented way. Those from government, from the private sector, from academia, from medical groups, and individual consumers to try to find solutions. So today we're gonna to be hearing from our experts about what's happening both nationally and at the state level. We'll be examining special challenges and also looking for success stories at the state level and nationally and looking for common ground and trying to agree on steps going forward. And we wanna hear from online viewers too. We will spend the last 15 minutes of this town hall taking your questions, which you can email anytime to addictions at astho.org. So Mike, let's start with you. Uh, as the former director of the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, you have seen uh, this epi epidemic from a national level. Uh, give us a sense of the big picture. Sure. So thank you, Dr. Coe. It's a pleasure to be with you again with many of my colleagues here from the state level. I think as you acknowledged, you know, we have known for a long time that this has been a very complex epidemic, that there are multiple causes uh, that we have seen in terms of driving the epidemic that really required kind of comprehensive responses, comprehensive responses at the national, state, and local levels. And, you know, part of our work at the national level is really understanding the importance that states play, both in terms of resource allocation, state legislation, and state policy. So I think the farm today really provides a great example of how state leadership can really provide a driving force. But it's also required partnership with national, state, and local authorities in terms of the work that we're doing. I think the other major factor is that this has been an evolving epidemic as we've seen over the past 15 years. Like many epidemics, you know, we've seen this move and more from prescription drugs to lately heroin and new synthetic illicit opioids like fentanyl have really, I think, made us continue to think about how we evolve strategies over time to deal with demographic changes, geographic changes, and now substance use changes. And I think you'll hear from many of the panelists how they've adjusted to those issues. I also think it's important to understand that this has been a historically under-resourced issue uh, and that we are playing catch up in terms of treatment resources, prevention resources, uh, how we think about dealing with things like stigma that we know prevents a significant barrier. I will also say if we look at how we've made uh, uh, um, uh, positive improvements in other public health efforts, we have to sustain these over time. That this really is not going to be a one-shot deal and we know it's been 15 years in building and we know it's going to take us a while to be able to do that. I think out of these challenges, as you talked about, Dr. Coe, and I'll end here, that we've seen some extraordinary partnerships, and quite honestly, some unlikely partnerships, mm -hmm. develop in response to this. <laughs> public health and public safety working hand in hand on this issue. Uh, we've seen all sectors of society begin to come together. Employees, faith communities, I think, understand that they have an extraordinary role to play. So I think uh, you'll hear from many of the panelists talking about some of those uh, uh, specific examples and underscoring the importance of this partnership. 
Uh, Mike, thanks for those opening comments and that national perspective. Let's turn to uh, Jay Butler. Jay uh, Aslo has been a vital voice in the national discussion, including providing recommendations for the President's Commission on Combating Drug Addiction and the Opioid Crisis. Uh, what role do you see for ASTHO, and more specifically, uh, what are some unique features of the crisis in your home state of Alaska? Well, thank you, Dr. Coe, and thank you for the honor to be able to be with you uh, today and be able to uh, speak to everyone here as well as uh, those who are online. The role of ASTO has been to bring state health officials together to focus on this emerging crisis. And so the president's challenge, which is something that happens each year for this year while I'm president of ASTO, has been public health approaches to substance misuse and addiction prevention. And it provides a framework then to talk about the multi-tier, multi-layer, and multi-sectoral approaches that we need to begin to untangle what you very well described as a very complex <coughs> public health challenge. When I say multi-tier, I tend to think of the multiple levels of intervention as we look at the progression over time for the individual who is at risk for addiction, who's struggling with addiction, and who's at risk of a fatal outcome due to addiction. So using that paradigm, I think in terms of tertiary prevention, these are the measures that we do to save lives. Things like naloxone provision, access to clean needles and syringes to prevent bloodborne infections. But these are just tourniquets. We would never approach trauma management with tourniquets alone. We need to then be able to provide more definitive care and also look at how do we prevent those issues from occurring to begin with. So secondary prevention is screening and treatment. And I'll just summarize it by saying it's addressing the barriers that we currently have. One is we don't have enough providers. And I think a number of us in the room who have been clinicians not specializing in addiction medicine have had that frustration of sitting with the patient that is recovery ready, they want to seek treatment, and we don't know what to do or how to get them into care. Um, and that frustration is part of what's, uh, I think, driven me in my role as uh, the state health official in Alaska to really want to focus on this. The second barrier, and I, I have to give a, a shout out to Mr. Botticelli and uh, his leadership in this, is removing the stigma that's associated with addiction and improving the understanding of addiction as a chronic health condition, not just a criminal justice issue, not just a moral failing, not just bad choices, but an issue that has to be also based as recognizing the health issue involving the brain that it is. Primary prevention addresses how do we take away the need to medicate, uh, is addressing issues like adverse childhood experiences, historical traumas in some of our communities, integration of behavioral health and, and primary care but also addressing some of the supply issues as it relates to how we manage pain, encouraging judicious pain management, just as over 20 years the public health system has addressed judicious use of antimicrobial drugs, and then also the flow of illicit drugs. In terms of what's unique about Alaska, uh, you know, in terms of the crisis, what really strikes me as most unique is the lack of uniqueness. Uh, I think Alaska is a great way to highlight the extensiveness of this crisis throughout North America. Uh, I know of a, a small rural village, uh, literally uh, an hour jet ride out of Anchorage to then get on a, a two-prop plane. You stop in a, a number of villages on the way. This really remote village uh, had a cluster of four fentanyl deaths, uh, four fentanyl overdoses, excuse me, and one death uh, in one day. And I think that shows just how much the problem of opioids has really permeated throughout uh, the, the continent. In terms of the response, though, we have done something uh, unique, although I, I have to uh, uh, give a, a, a nod to uh, Commissioner uh, Burrell. Uh, we are in an incident command structure, and that was instituted uh, after Governor Walker declared the opioid crisis a disaster. 
And that provided the opportunity to bring together members of the cabinet as well as staff in a structure very much like we would do for a wildfire response. I mean, we literally have a planning team, a logistics team, a operations team, a, a finance team, and all of this reports to the governor. And it provides that opportunity for cross-sectoral collaboration to be able to address this as the complex issue that it is. Jay, thank you for your good opening comments. So uh, now let's turn to Rachel. And Rachel, thank you for joining us from Pennsylvania. Uh, give us an idea of what's happening in your state. Good afternoon. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me today. Thank you, Dr. Koh. So um, you had mentioned, Dr. Butler, about prevention. And so we have the same issues in Pennsylvania that you all have in Alaska and really throughout the nation. Uh, clearly, the uh, opioid crisis is the public health crisis of our time. And so we have had a number of successes, and one of those has been in primary prevention. And the term that I like to use to that in terms of working with healthcare providers is opioid stewardship. And the parallel is to antibiotic stewardship. We know that antibiotics are a, uh, a critical um, tool in our medical toolbox, but because of overprescribing, uh, and the dangers of microbial resistance, we have to learn to use antibiotics more carefully and judiciously. The parallel is to opioids. Opioids are essential medicines, and for patients who just had an operation this morning or had major trauma, they need opioids. For some patients, chronic pain, such as cancer pain or end-of-life pain, they need opioids. But because of the, the uh, overprescribing and the crisis we see today, we all have to learn to use opioids more carefully and more judiciously. That's the term opioids. To accomplish this in Pennsylvania, we have done a number of different measures. And the first measure um, has been working with the medical schools to develop a set of core competencies that every medical student should have about these issues. Massachusetts was actually the first state to do this. And so we had a convening of all of the medical schools of our state, osteopathic and allopathic medical schools. And over the course of a year, developed a number of core competencies for medical students. So those include uh, understanding the core aspects of addiction, understanding screening for substance use disorder, referral and treatment for substance use disorder, uh, proper patient assessment, uh, proper multimodal treatment for pain, uh, proper use of opioids for treating acute pain and chronic pain, risk assessment when using opioids, and then how to educate patients about opioids, how to prescribe them correctly, and how to wean patients off them. The second thing we've done is to emphasize continuing education. So actually, we had legislation last year requiring that healthcare professionals, prescribers, and dispensers would uh, have continuing education about opioids. And with the help of the Pennsylvania Medical Society, and other professional societies, we've developed a set of six modules of, pay, of uh, continuing education for healthcare providers. And again, that's now required for their license. This is available on the Pennsylvania Medical Society website, but also other healthcare professional associations websites. That includes the Dental Association, Nurse Practitioner Association, PA Association, Pharmacist Association, et cetera. And these are all for free. For any, for any uh, provider in Pennsylvania, uh, whether they belong to that association or not. And those modules include modules about prescribing guidelines, about naloxone, about the prescription drug monitoring program, uh, and about how to prescribe um, uh, and how to treat chronic pain without opioids. So we have a set of those modules. In addition, we have worked on prescribing guidelines. Now, there are many different prescribing guidelines, including the, uh, the CDC guidelines. And so our guidelines are specialty and location specific, and they dovetail with the CDC guidelines. So we have guidelines for the emergency department, for dental guidelines, pharmacist guidelines, OBGYN guidelines, geriatric guidelines, um, orthopedics and sports medicine guidelines, and the newest ones, which will be published shortly, are pediatric and adolescent guidelines. Now, these are living documents, and so we're actually going back to revise the chronic non-cancer pain guidelines currently, and we'll have a revision of that, which will include a whole module on how to treat chronic pain 
without opioids. Other medications to use, other modalities such as physical therapy, occupational therapy, and even other, other treatments such as complementary medicine treatments such as acupuncture. So we'll be including that in our guidelines, and this is a continuous process. All these guidelines have been brought to the respective professional boards for their affirmation and acceptance to develop, to develop a, a standard of care. So you can see that we have been working um, uh, on many different aspects uh, for not just physicians, but other healthcare pro uh, providers on this concept of opioid stewardship for primary prevention in terms of the opioid crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, for your uh, fascinating comments. So let's uh, return to the studio now and uh, welcome Monica Burrell, who actually is a graduate of the school. So we're delighted to have you back, Monica. You. Uh, she now, of course, is the Massachusetts Commissioner of Public Health. Uh, Monica, tell us some of your thoughts about the crisis in our state of Massachusetts. Sure, thank you. First, I'm honored to be back at the school and was honored to be taught by so many leading public health thinkers. So I um, appreciate that opportunity and privilege to be here with my colleagues today. Um, and think it's so important that we do what we're doing today. We come together, learn from each other, share our experiences, because that is the way that we will be able to most effectively address this epidemic. So talking a little bit about Massachusetts, when um, Governor Baker began in January of 2015, he put together a cross-sectoral opiate working group. And from that working group, we developed a Massachusetts 65 steps recommendations and then an action plan to how we will address this devastating epidemic. And that was done along the spectrum of prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery efforts. One of the key roles at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health played was around better understanding data. You've heard from each of my complex how, excuse me, from my colleagues, how complex this health issue is. And we all know that when we're trying to understand multi a complex issue, we need to understand first the origins of it, who is affected, how they're affected, why, and then develop from that information actionable policies. So part of that effort has been in Massachusetts for the first time, we now release quarterly death reports where we um, really describe um, who the individuals are who are dying from this devastating disease, where they are, and some other um, information related to the deaths. Additionally, we've put out two in-depth reports um, the, those of you in the audience have one data brief from that report, and we'll make that available for everybody. And in those reports, we really dig deeper and look across state agencies in different sectors to start to understand who the individuals are, who are at risk for disease, what their pathway is to the disease, and what we can do to impact change and effective treatment for them. So talking for a minute about prevention, um, hopefully in the question and answer period, we'll have a chance to talk about primary prevention a little bit more. But um, one of the areas of prevention that we focused on, just like Dr. Levine spoke about, is with prescribers and dispensers. And the really important to understand, in this opiate epidemic, we know that four out of five users of illicit heroin or other agents such as fentanyl, four out of five of them state that they started with a prescription medication. So we know that that prescription medication was either their own or something that they got from family or friends or other individuals. So we knew that we had to do some education and some information sharing with prescribers. So along that line, Massachusetts, I believe, is still the only state where when you graduate from either medical school, dental school, from an advanced practice um, nursing program, or from a PA program, you must take a required substance use disease training. And if you think about that, it may seem remarkable, but we would never say you can graduate from any of those professional schools without understanding how to take care of cardiac disease or diabetes or some other medical disease. Additionally, um, we were one of the first states to require checking of the prescription monitoring program, the database on prescriptions, to help inform clinicians' decisions as they were seeing um, patients. Additionally, um, we required that the first 
prescription for an opioid be only seven days, and that was legislatively mandated. In order to assist our clinical colleagues in that, we uh, procured a new prescription monitoring program that was easier to use and had a better flow with our clinical systems. And as we talked about data and being precise about it, we are also very closely following our outcomes. So if you look at the first slide, please. On the first slide, you'll see here that um, when you look at our PMP, or Prescription Monitoring Program, you'll see that the use of the Prescription Monitoring Program has rapidly increased. And that increase is directly related to the passing of the legislation as well as the use of the new easier to use system. And importantly related to that, you'll see that the burden or the volume of Schedule II opiates in Massachusetts is down by 28 percent since 2015. So we're really seeing a decrease in the amount of opiates out in our community. Additionally, as I told you, we put out quarterly reports. And I'm hopeful and encouraged that for the first time from January to July of this year, we've seen a slight reduction in the number of opiate deaths um, in Massachusetts. It's about 5% compared to the first six months of last year. And we'll follow it closely, but it's signs that we may be turning the tide. As we talk about um, treatment and recovery, one of the areas, one of the reasons that we're looking at data in this way is to make sure that we understand who the populations at greatest risk of death are. And part of that work has been to understand who those populations are and what are the sectors we can engage to help improve the care that they receive. Next slide, please. If you look at this slide, you'll see that individuals who had a history of incarceration, so either prison or jail, those individuals upon release have a 120-fold higher risk of dying from opiates than their counterparts. Based on this, we have been able to open new dialogues with our criminal justice colleagues and talk in a new way about starting treatment before release and at the time of release, how to transition and do a warm handoff, if you will, so that those individuals can get the care that they need. We also recently put out a grant so that our um, jails could start to do treatment before an individual is released, medication and treatment, and then do case management upon release. So another example of how we're taking the data, looking at it in new ways that we haven't looked at before, turning that data into information, actionable information, and then making policy changes and program changes based on that. Um, and I'll end by saying, you know, we um, talk about challenges, and I think one of the biggest challenges with this um, opiate epidemic, this current opiate epidemic, is how fast it's changing. None of us five years ago had predicted that fentanyl would come in and have the deadly results that it did. Having the information is helpful, but staying ahead of it and whatever is coming next is challenging. We haven't seen this rate in Massachusetts of death from any one disease, this rate since the beginning of the HIV AIDS epidemic. So it's a real crisis that, you know, I'm, I'm so proud that we're all, um, all hands on deck for this and really gonna stay with this for as long as it takes. Thank you. Monica, thank you very much. And our final opening commenter will be Terry Klein. Uh, Terry, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I know you happen to be in ASTHO headquarters in DC right now, but uh, we're eager to hear about your perspective uh, as the health leader in Oklahoma. Great. Well, thank you, Howard. Thank you for moderating today's session. Thanks to the TH Chan School of Public Health, and thanks to ASTO as well uh, for providing us with this opportunity. And Dr. Butler, thank you for shining a bright light on this critical issue. It's greatly appreciated. In Oklahoma, we've had a number of challenges, and unfortunately, at one point, we had the distinction of being the state with the highest prescribing per capita of opioids in the entire country. We had remained for several years in the top five. Our governor, Governor Mary Fallon, very, very concerned about these issues and impact on people's lives and the uh, unnecessary loss of life in our state. She put together a task force, Dr. Burrell, sounds very similar to the one that was created in your state. Uh, and actually, it's been great just hearing ideas from different states looking for similar things. That's some new things that I can take home, too. The governor pulled this task force together. I co chaired with Terry White, who is the commissioner for the Oklahoma State. Department of Mental Health and, and Substance Abuse Services. And it was a very diverse group of individuals. We ended up with a comprehensive plan that was released in 2013. So this was uh, several years ago. And went all the way from uh, that prevention uh, place on the spectrum, 
over to treatment and intervention, but had several different components. On the prevention side, education for individuals, for communities, for providers, uh, and prescribers. And then looking at appropriate disposal and storage of opioids. Uh, again, education and information for those various groups, because we all have different roles and different tasks we can have in response to that. Then looking at tracking and monitoring. And of course, people in public health, we understand surveillance and the importance of that. And that's a real contribution that we have to add uh, to this current crisis in terms of the solution. And then uh, moving to enforcement and regulation and the role and looking at those opportunities to intervene at that level. And then ending with treatment and uh, interventions and recovery to make sure that we're actually providing systems support people in their recovery. I would say this is a comprehensive system that is only as strong as its weakest link. Certainly we hope that people, certainly in our state, were able to implement all of these different levels. And failure to do uh, any one of these components, I believe, would lead to uh, overall failure and ineffectiveness of this comprehensive plan. I'm going to close with two slides. So I'm going to ask that one of those slides gets pulled up. Now, hopefully, you can see that the bar graph that actually has the unintentional opioid related overdose death rates and a trend line for opioid prescribing in the state. So, there's a bar graph like this. Hopefully, you're seeing that there. I see some puzzled looks as I look at the screen up there, so hopefully, you can see that. And then a trend line. And as we know, it is alluded to uh, obviously, the more prescriptions that we have written for opioids. Opioids that are available to the general public, uh, the higher uh, death rate we can expect to see. You can see a steady incline uh, for several years. On the left hand side of that chart, it starts in 2000. On the far right side, it goes to 2015. But you'll see that that peak, uh, both for prescribing and for opioid deaths, then started to come down between 2013 and 2014. Oklahoma was one of 12 states that saw a statistically significant decline uh, in deaths. So uh, that's uh, important because that's more lives saved. Still, except for way high. I will tell you that we have data for 2016 as well. So preliminary data on data folks, we let me put those data out there until they've been verified. But they reflect a continuing trend, uh, not as steep as the one you see in that slide but still a, tr a downward trend. And then the last slide I wanted to show you, the next slide, which is also the last, is a huge downward trend that looks at uh, doctor shopping. And we were one of the few states that had a um, prescription drug monitoring program up and virtual uh, early in the process. And there have been a number of changes that have taken place over the last several years. Uh, it's interesting, you can see like historic rebounds, you can see you know, people, who they hear something's about to happen, they rush out and get a lot of prescriptions. Uh, so there are some challenges like that as well. But a very, very steady decline. Dr. Shopping, by the way, there's a national student that really set it, uh, receiving five prescriptions from five different doctors and five different pharmacies within a three month period. Uh, and those numbers were very high, they have gone down. We have some ongoing challenges to close out with that. We have a large uh, American Indian population in our state, uh, and they're not required to uh, provide data into the PDMP. So we've been working uh, around a, a formal agreement that would allow us to do that. We're not quite there yet. IHS, actually the whole entity, is, uh, Indian Health Services, has not been data, but they voluntarily are providing data into this, and uh, Admiral Meeks is uh, and then we have a large number of, of military installations in our state as well. And as uh, federal entities, they're not required to provide data into the PPP. And we're working on that as well. The government can convene uh, the heads of all of the military installations in the state. So uh, we have big challenges that continue. The number of lives lost is absolutely acceptable. Uh, we can demonstrate that when we work collectively, we work together in a concerted effort and use data. Uh, to our benefit, we can make a difference. That all close. Thank you. Terry, thank you so much. So we've had some fascinating opening comments from our panel. And for the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes or so, we're going to 
dig a little deeper now into these uh, two broad themes of prevention and treatment. So let's start with prevention. I'm, I'm going to particularly ask Jay and Terry to say a little bit more about those uh, themes that have been mentioned so far. Jay, you gave us a nice overview on how you look at prevention in terms of primary, secondary, ter tertiary. Do you want to amplify some of those comments? Well, let me just say a little more about the secondary level and the, the aspects related to treatment. Um, stigma, sometimes there's, there's been a little pushback on that. Well, aren't you just being politically correct in the kind of language you use? And I really want to press the, forward the point that it's also technically correct sometimes what we're talking about. Uh, and let me just use an example. Uh, oftentimes people talk about access to detox and detox number of detox beds that are available. Well, I mean, detox sort of conjures images of something that you fly to Los Angeles and get a lot of enemas and then you're, you're well and you go home. <laughs> that is not what withdrawal management is. And it fails to recognize the chronicity of addiction. And so, you know, yes, I do not like the term detox. I like to talk about withdrawal management because I think that is actually technically appropriate as well as overcoming some of the stigma that may be implied in suggesting that someone who uh, is struggling with addiction is somehow uh, a toxic person or uh, contaminated uh, in some way. And we, we have to sometimes begin to change the language and how we communicate before we can begin changing how we perceive these problems and approach them. Jay, thank you. Terry, do you want to say more about uh perspectives on prevention from your uh, perch in Oklahoma? Sure. Thank you, Howard. Uh, I think we heard pieces of this already when we were talking about education and uh, prescribers' guidelines. Of course, we all understand and live this mantra uh, in understanding that prevention is better than cure. If we can move upstream and uh, educate primarily our prescribers uh, and provide them with the tools they need to be successful, I think that was a big push with the uh, prescription drug monitoring. I will tell you, just so people are prepared and not surprised, uh, we had a lot of pushback. We were uh, introducing legislation to uh, make checking the PDMP mandatory, an incredible amount of pushback from some of our medical associations. We saw it as an unfunded mandate. Uh, and then it was our responsibility to educate. Um, absolutely came on board and fantastic. Programs. And again, we saw those results earlier. So I believe that education can make a difference. Providing technical assistance, we did some hot spotting uh, areas where we were saying uh, higher levels of prescribing. Actually sending out teams, which is a little bit more labor intensive. Want to let people know, yes, we do see this, and yes, we're concerned about it, uh, which is an intervention of itself. But then helping people understand the utility or lack of utility sometimes in uh, uh, overprescribing and alternatives that they might have. So those, I think, are very important components that are part of the continuum that focuses on prevention. Terry, thank you. And let's drill down a little bit more on the treatment uh, broad theme and the treatment sub-themes. I'm going to ask Monica, Rachel, and Mike to comment uh, on this further in that order. So Monica, do you want to start? Say a little bit more about treatment strategies in Massachusetts, what you think is going to be ultimately successful here? Sure. Thank you, Howard. I think. Um, you know, treatment, one of the things I want to make sure we um, touch on is the intervention of naloxone. So um, when you think about opiates, unlike some other um, sources of substance use disorder, with opiates we have a drug, a medication that works to reverse a potential overdose death, and that's naloxone, sometimes referred to as Narcan. And we know that if naloxone is given, you can potentially save someone and reverse an overdose and decrease those numbers of increased deaths we're seeing. We also know from mathematical studies that if you hypothetically have an entire community have access or pe be penetrated, if you will, with naloxone, that you decrease the overdoses by 46 percent, so almost 50 percent. So think again about blood pressure medicines or diabetes or cholesterol. If you had a 50 percent reduction, that would be pretty good. So. Um, part of our work in Massachusetts is to make sure that we expand the access and people's understanding of the use and potential of naloxone. So we have a three 
uh, prong program here in Massachusetts. The first and oldest actually started back in 2007, and it's called our bystander program, if you will. And that's making accessible for the first time to individuals who have substance use disorder, their family, friends, um, health and human service workers, and others who might encounter individuals who are suffering from substance use disorder training on what to do when you find someone who's potentially overdosing, and then um, providing them with naloxone. And in this program, since its inception, we've trained over 60,000 individuals across Massachusetts, and we have documented 10,000-plus um, rescues at least. So um, you know that's a program that we continue as we look at our um, data and information to say where don't we have full understanding of naloxone, how it should be used, how it can save lives. And I must say with fentanyl, which we have lots of reports of having to do repeated doses, we have found that we are so happy that we have this program in place because people are having to give naloxone while they're waiting, for example, for 911 to arrive because the fentanyl acts so powerfully and so quickly. The second piece of our um, naloxone program um, is around first responders. So in Massachusetts, um, the majority of communities fire an ambulance, now carry naloxone. And in order to make it um, easier to purchase it, we have a bulk purchasing program where they can buy from the state at a reduced rate to help them be able to afford the naloxone and be, as first responders, able to quickly get in and do what they need to do. And the final arm of the program is um, prescribers and pharmacists. So pharmacists can have standing orders, um, so we're educating them about giving out naloxone. And prescribers, we're doing a lot of education, both at the medical school residency and continuing practice prescribers, so they understand to use um, naloxone and think about it and think about when a patient in front of them might need it. Thank you, Monica. Rachel, do you want to say more about treatment strategies and uh, hopes for successful strategies in the future in Pennsylvania? Yes, thank you very much for the opportunity. So um, uh, we have a similar program as Dr. Burrell had talked about in terms of naloxone, uh, distribution to communities, um, to, uh, to first responders, as well as to the public. What I wanted to emphasize in, in terms of treatment strategies um, is a new program that we will be uh, putting out over the course of the next number of months. And this is with funding from the 21st Century Cures Act uh, passed by Congress and signed by President Obama in to, in, uh, at the end of 2016. And this program is called PACMAT, not PACMAN, but PACMAT, Pennsylvania Coordinated Medication Assisted Treatment. And so PACMAT is, is a program which is a hub and spokes model uh, patterned after the hub and spokes models in Vermont and Rhode Island and, and some other states. But it's actually um, a, a pretty ambitious program to be able to expand access to medication assisted treatment, particularly buprenorphine and Vivitrol throughout Pennsylvania. And so it involve a hub, which would be, for instance, a, a addiction center, uh, for instance, at maybe one of our excellent health systems, and then utilizing the health system's primary care network of physicians such as family physicians, internal medicine physicians, maybe OBGYN or pediatrics. And, uh, and it would involve coordination between the hub and the spokes. The reimbursement models would be primarily fee-for-service, for the, for the spokes, including the primary care physicians, and then everyone would have counseling and therapy, and then some sort of global, global payment model for the hub. One example might be a risk-adjusted capitated rate uh, that the hub would negotiate with the insurance companies. So we're going to actually be having startup money through the 21st Century Cures Grant, and then this model is supposed to, it needs to be self-sustaining. So the goal is to be able to provide quality, state-of-the-art, evidence-based, medication-assisted treatment throughout Pennsylvania, including urban Pennsylvania, suburban Pennsylvania, and rural Pennsylvania, uh, and throughout the Commonwealth. Thank you, uh, Rachel. That's fascinating. And Mike, please give us uh, some more comments about treatment themes uh, from the national perspective. Sure. So uh, many of us have talked about the parallels with the HIV epidemic, and clearly we've seen mortality associated with this. But we saw a very steep decline in mortality associated with HIV after the introduction of antiretroviral therapy, uh, not only the introduction, but the swift uptake. And in very similar ways, we have three highly effective medications for the treatment of people with opioid use disorders that have been shown to be highly effective in both treatment engagement and reducing mortality, and far better than treatment without these medications. The challenge becomes we need better and swifter uptake of these medications in many areas of both 
health care, our treatment system, our criminal justice system. We have too few physicians uh, who have taken the course, uh, the waiver course, to prescribe uh, these medications. And some of the things that we did federally was actually mandate that programs like drug courts can no longer deny people access to these medications. We actually worked with Health and Human Services to increase the patient cap on physicians who are able to treat people from 100 to 225. Uh, we actually worked with Congress to expand the prescribers to allow nurse practitioners and physicians' assistants to allow them to prescribe these uh, medications. Um, you know, but we have still seen we have a long way to go. A uh, researcher, one of my colleagues, at Boston Medical Center just published a study, a very large study, that despite American Academy of Pediatric guidance that both adolescents and young adults should be getting on medication-assisted treatment, only one in four adolescents with an opioid use disorder was getting on medications, and that uh, disparity was actually even greater among kids of color. So we still have a long way to go in making and ensuring that medication-assisted treatment is the standard of care for people with opioid use disorders. Okay, uh, f fascinating. So um, let's move on now to uh, question and answer, both online and from the audience. Uh, I'm amazed to state that we are on time so far. So we got <laughs> we, we got a lot of uh, we got a lot a lot of time for Q and A. So uh, my wonderful colleague Elizabeth Walker Romero will give us a couple questions from the online audience. Sure, and uh, the email is addictions at asto.org if you have any questions. But uh, the first one is from Pennsylvania. If states and jurisdictions are already engaged in so many initiatives and feel like they're doing everything they can already. What advice would you have to help them expand and improve what they're doing? And this is for everyone. Okay, I don't know, Rachel, that's a Pennsylvania question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you want to take that one or not. <laughs> sure. Um, so, you know, Governor Wolf and the administration is committed to addressing the opioid epidemic in a broad way. And I think someone had mentioned the concept of all hands on deck, and I think that that is the approach. So we have um, all of the agencies uh, working together, Department of Health, Human Services, Drug and Alcohol Programs, Correction State, uh, all working together. We work hand in hand with the legislature. This is a completely nonpartisan issue. The state is working with the communities and with the counties. And then, of course, working with other states through great organizations like ESTO and working with the federal government. So I think that we all have to work together. We have to engage stakeholders such as the, the uh, medical community, uh, the recovery community, et cetera. So, um, uh, you know, this is the public health issue of our time. And I think that only by coordinating and working together on all the different efforts that we've been discussing, prevention, rescue with naloxone, um, warm handoff, I think was mentioned, a facilitated referral to treatment. We have to get people into treatment and then expanding treatment, of course, for opioid use disorder with, a, uh, with an emphasis on quality medication-assisted treatment. And I think, um, and, uh, and then finally, uh, re recovery. And I think by that type of coordinated approach, you know, I'm a positive and optimistic person. And I think that we will be able to overcome this crisis. Thank you. Do other members of the panel want to address that question? I think, you know, uh, what I would add to what Rachel said, and I agree with all of that, is that, you know, this epidemic, and somebody mentioned it earlier, it took us a while to get to where we are in this. And, you know, all of these interventions that we have in place, we need to keep doing them for a while until we start to see the changes. So we have to have a sustained focus and attention to this issue until we see the results that we need to see. Thank you. Howard, I'd just like to add Please. that oftentimes our public health approach has been to come into the community with the answer. And in this case, mm -hmm. we don't have the answer. Mm -hmm. uh, I recently had a colleague that I hadn't seen in a couple years say, so, so what, what is the solution to the opioid crisis? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, the first solution is recognizing there is no the solution. Uh, it's going to be solutions. And so it is going to be oftentimes driven at the community level. So this, this question is actually intriguing because it sounds like it's coming from the community level. And that may be where uh, we're going to see the best examples of everyone who needs to be involved coming together, including uh, elected officials, medical providers, behavioral health providers, the faith community and uh, perhaps most importantly, people who are in recovery, as well as families of people who are currently struggling with addictions. Great, Elizabeth. Howard, this, is, this is Terry Klein. Oh, please go ahead. Please go ahead, please. 
So I'm actually going to steal uh, part of Dr. Butler's uh, speech that he's given to me and to others, and I thought he was going to say it there, so I'll just jump in, uh, channel uh, Dr. Butler right now. Uh, I think that you know one of the issues that comes up is really about, uh, you look at what's the next thing that we need to be doing and focusing on, it's really about developing that infrastructure and having sustainability, and that we can't find ourselves going from one drug to another drug with interventions and systems and community responses that are so specific that we have to retool absolutely each and every time uh, the new drug comes along that none of us could ever have imagined out there uh, in our families and in our communities. But they continue to come at an alarming rate. We saw it with fentanyl, we see it with carfentanil and other things. So I think it's really about developing capacity that's sustainable too, uh, that we know will be and it's like our preparedness. I think using that model, I think that's part what we have to offer in public health. Hey, Terry. So, so Mike, you're, you're the last one. You may as well comment on this one too. Sure. Um, <laughs> so, so a couple of things, and I couldn't agree more with the fact that you know, our approaches can't be static here, right? So we've seen this continue to evolve. And having been back in Massachusetts, I want to compliment Commissioner Burrell for doing what I never got to be able to do in Massachusetts, and that is really have this comprehensive data set to really be able to continue and almost real-time way monitor the impact of this epidemic. You know, at the federal level, we were often operating on two-year-old data, and it doesn't really create for um, uh, quick policy responses to this. So I, I, I can't say that enough. Um, you know, one of the things that I think also warrants mention uh, that might not be on topic, but I think it's really important. So in addition to the mortality that we've seen, We've also seen a tripling of hepatitis C cases. We've seen a tripling in neonatal abstinence. We've seen localized outbreaks of HIV. So when we talk about treatment, we're not just talking about addiction treatment. We're talking, and many of our patients have comorbid mental health conditions as well. So people really need access to comprehensive uh, medical care in addition as, as an adjunct to their addiction treatment. So because we know that if we're not treating all of those issues, we're not going to be successful with addiction treatment. But I think we need to continue to kind of monitor and evaluate our strategies and continue to monitor the data and the trends to really make sure that we, to the extent possible, can see around the corner for this epidemic. Okay, all great uh, comments. Thank you. Let's, let's go to the in-studio audience. Does anybody in the studio want to ask a question to the panel? Over here, and we have the state health. Yes, hi, uh, from, I'm Lisa uh, Morris. I'm the state health official from New Hampshire. Welcome. And thank you, um, and thank you for uh, for the panelists and the information that you're giving us. Um, so, uh, in the past, there have been strategies that we have been using for years before this uh, around prevention. I'm speaking primarily for prevention um, strategies that we've been using that may or may not have been effective. And this is a long-term issue that we're talking about. We're going to be dealing with this for many years to come. And so, um, resources may need to be shifted uh, in order to, from what we used to do to what we now know is uh, that we have better outcomes on. So have you had any experiences where you've taken uh, funding that was previously used for uh, strategies such as, uh, I'm, make, I, I'm just using these as examples, community coalition building, um, education promotion, those sorts of things, um, and shifted those resources to, um, to some of the new strategies that are being used to fight the opioid epidemic? Okay, anybody want to respond to that one? Um, you know, Lisa, just to make a comment, in Massachusetts, um, as we have been addressing this epidemic in the last two and a half years or so, we've actually increased our funding towards it by about 50%. So we have seen new funding in the area. And I think I think about it a little bit different. Um, a couple of our, uh, my, our colleagues here spoke about foundation building. And I think part of what we're doing with our current response is we're building the foundation that many of us who've been in the field for a long time thought we should have always had for substance use disorder and addiction and how we think about it as a society, as the medical disease, the chronic medical disease that it is. So part of what we're doing is building that foundation and I see it as, you know, when you talk about the coalitions or the prevention campaigns, it's building a foundation where, for example, when we're teaching children about resilience and about, um, you know, the dangers of medications that aren't your own and so on, we're building a foundation for them that serves other purposes as well. So we know that, you know, 90% of adult individuals with substance use disorder started before the age of 18. So in that valuable teen age, how can we get to individuals in a way where the message serves them for many different issues? 
Others on the panel want to respond to uh, this question? Yeah. Jay? Um, I think you really raise an important point. And historically, public health really hasn't been at the table for this discussion. I um, mean, public health owned tobacco years ago, but you know, for so many years, if a question came up about drug use or even alcoholism, the answer routinely was, uh, oh, that's a behavioral health issue. Um, I had a colleague in behavioral health who uh, called me very early uh, after my appointment and said, boy, I need public health at the table. And my first thought was, what, is there a foodborne outbreak after your luncheon? <laughs> I, 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 I didn't really understand. But he helped me understand that historically a lot of the focus in behavioral health has been on individual client services and supporting those providers who provide those individual services rather than the population-based approaches that we're more accustomed to in public health. So it really is both. It's not an either or. Um, I probably make some people uncomfortable because I say the, the swim lane analogy is not good. It's a game of water polo, and we are all moving around in the same pool, but we have the set common goal. Thank you. Uh, Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, uh, a I just follow a comment from Mike, and we'll go to another question uh, in the studio. Go I just want to, the, those of us who've been doing public health work for longer than we care to admit, often see that there's never a plus up in public health just in general, that we move money from crises to crises to crises. Um, and, you know, to your point, like, what are the opportunities? And I think it's actually about reinvesting money in, from our criminal justice system that really needs to focus on public health-related strategies that, particularly in the addiction space, we know that many people with untreated addiction are ending up in our criminal justice system. And I think we've shown that we can, through good prevention and good treatment, reinvest those dollars for people who, and many states across the political spectrum are really looking at this kind of justice reinvestment and taking money that we used to spend on incarceration incarcerating people and using those for public health strategies. And I think it's really worthwhile that many states, um, I think, are investing in that kind of, of reinvestment strategy. Fascinating. Let's move to another question. Professor Blendon. Uh, so uh, with Mike and others, we've been involved in polling. And there is one finding that is very critical and it tends to be missed. A large share of the general public means when they hear the word treatment, it's 90 days and you're out. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in the debate about Medicaid and the ACA, the discussion came up, give them some money uh, instead of Medicaid, and they'll get treated for 90 days, and then people go on. Uh, there is not a great deal of public understanding uh, that this may be closer to diabetes uh, than it is to a 90-day treatment in oncology or something like that. And this really affects legislators who are talking about one-time sets of treatments. They come out of prison, they get X amount, you send them going. And you would have a totally different treatment center if you actually, if this is methadone for a lot of people's lives, it's a totally different set of, of, of legislators of policies in, in people's minds, and the funding is different. And if just listen to people politically talk about this, many of them really are discussing this as if it was a short-term mm -hmm. treatment, and that will affect the politics of this unless people understand, as I do from you, that this is not, for most people, going to be a 90-day-and-out event. That's a great point, uh, Professor Blunder. I don't know if Rachel or Terry in particular want to sure. comment on that. Sure. So, I mean, I think that uh, that we have to understand um, that addiction is a is a chronic disease. That's been mentioned, a chronic relapsing brain disease, as I believe Dr. Uh, Murthy, our previous Surgeon General, had reported. I would like to highlight his report, which I thought was outstanding um, last year. And I think that um, that we need to have a comprehensive treatment model that has um, a collaboration, as has been mentioned, between medical issues and behavioral health issues, because your mind and body are connected. You know, we didn't learn that in medical school, but that's the way it is. Um, and so I, I think that also we have to get away from the idea that all of the patients are going to be in beds that they're all going to be inpatient because we'll never have enough inpatient beds. And to be honest with you, for many patients, inpatient treatment is not the, the, the best way to go. That the, we need to think about more treatment slots, uh, about treatment which is gonna be predominantly outpatient treatment. And, and that informed the, the, the evolution of that program, the, the PACMED program, and it involves the patient's primary care doctors. Um, who would also be assessing their their uh, their hepatitis or uh, other risk factors, um, who might be prescribing the medication, 
um, and then a collaboration with therapists so that the medication assists the treatment. And then um, when the primary care doctor might have questions or problems, they have access to an addiction specialist network uh, to be able to contact. And the addiction specialist network can also have contact with mental health and with pain, uh, chronic pain and with mental health. So I think that that type of ongoing care will be necessary. And we have to think about treatment availability that will be sustainable for the long term. Thank you. Uh, we have several other uh, state health officials in the room, and I think Dr. Alexander Scott, do you, have, do you have a question from Rhode Island? I do, thank you. Thank you. So in Rhode Island, our governor, Gina Raimondo, signed the second executive order in July of this year um, to really put a focus on implementation efforts for our state, really highlighting um, the strategy that's been um, reflective of what many have spoken of here, focusing on prevention, treatment, recovery, and reversal. Um, I applaud her because within the executive order, there was a charge to really explore harm reduction strategies, particularly for intravenous drug users. And I wanted to get a sense from you all what um, type of political climate or ability you think we have in this country to begin really developing opportunities for IV drug users while encouraging them to um, stop using and provide the wraparound services to help that, also providing an environment for them to use safely if they um, ended up needing to continue to use. I wanted to see what people's thoughts are on our ability to achieve that. Okay, fascinating question on harm reduction. Terry, I don't know if you want to start off uh, on this one. We're happy to, happy to start off. Thanks for the question. I wish that our uh, incoming Surgeon General was here to answer this question. Jerome Adams, because he has the, per the perfect uh, kind of model for doing just that in an environment where that would have been unheard of uh, years ago or just a couple of years ago. And I think being able to make the case, uh, and we've heard it woven into several of the other uh, comments about chronic disease management, making sure that we're using evidence-based interventions. Look at the data. The data are very clear. And again, this isn't new. And going all the way back to uh, Dr. Satcher's comments, uh, the difference between knowing and doing can be fatal. We know what to do in this situation. We have data, we have examples uh, that tell us that these are very effective interventions. And I think that Dr. Adams found the right opportunity. He made sure that it didn't go to waste. Uh, and had it not been for that crisis on his front door, uh, he probably would not have been able to do it as quickly as he did. So I think we need to look for those opportunities, make sure that we're educated about those tools so that we're ready to pounce uh, when the opportunity presents itself. All right, thank you. Let's go back to uh, an online question, Elizabeth. Yes, this is from Dr. Ed Ellinger in Minnesota. Um, there are huge disparities in deaths from opioids. Are our interventions and prevention activities geared to reducing these disparities? So maybe one or two responses uh, for this one, just in the interest of time. Who wants to take this? Maybe if I could okay, just go, ahead. Uh, go first. I think this highlights the importance of community-driven responses. Um, I think of, in my state, uh, the importance of tribal organizations and tribal governments developing local responses that the role for state health oftentimes is to support those uh, the, that work that is happening at the community level so that it can be uh, culturally competent and appropriate for the, the people in that community. Um, and just to echo on that, I think it's an excellent point. And we know that in Massachusetts, this disease is affecting people across the entire state in every community. And when, we, when you look at, for example, the data brief that you have in front of you, part of the reason we looked at certain populations is to make sure that we understand, for example, that individuals experiencing homelessness have up to 30 times higher race of, rate of overdose. And in our interventions, we're very conscious to reach out to non-English speakers, sit with different communities, sit with our tribal partners, um, sit with our other community members and make sure that the information we're sharing is culturally appropriate and that it's getting to everybody who's impacted by our disease and we're measuring outcomes based on that as well. So it's a really critical and important piece that when we talk about fighting this current opiate epidemic, we're fighting it for all individuals. So to wrap up, uh, we're going to ask Mike Botticelli to give uh, a final couple of minutes of observation and 
Uh, Mike was so effective as a national leader uh, in his White House office, uh, not only as a public health professional, but as a person in recovery. So, Mike, I don't know if you want to make some final professional and personal comments on sure. this. Sure. Um, so, so I'll just echo some of the con uh, comments of folks here. I mean, clearly this is the defining health crisis of our time uh, that really requires an all-hands-on-deck uh, approach. Um, and that while we've seen significant mortality and morbidity associated with it, we've seen and I heard uh, the importance of leadership and particularly leadership at the state level. All of you, I think, referenced your governors uh, as leaders in this, and that's clearly what we need to kind of sustain our efforts. But, but also resources and that this is, we're making up for lost time and dramatic amounts of under resources here as well as sustainability over time. And, and I will say as a person in recovery, it's really refreshing for me uh, to hear the fact that addiction is getting, uh, the, the, and it unfortunately took a tremendous amount of morbidity and mortality to get there, but we're recognizing the role that stigma plays. And quite honestly, the voice of people in recovery and the role that they play both in terms of policy formation as well as diminishing some of the stigma that we have. So thanks, it was really a pleasure to be here today. Thank you, so uh, this is unfortunately the end of the virtual town hall. I declare this a smashing success. <laughs> Uh, really an outstanding panel, a great uh, interchange uh, across the country. We're, we're thrilled to have this level of interest and commitment and to work closely with us, though. Uh, we have the Executive Director, Mike Frazier, here, and I want to thank him for his leadership as well. If you have other questions, uh, please continue to send them to addictions at asthow.org, and we will send you follow-up answers. And we look forward to more sessions with ASTHO and other public health leaders around the country. Thank you very, very much.